February 8th. Hope everyone enjoyed my little cartoon. It's one of my favorites. Maybe because my mom gave it to me years ago. Thought it was kind of cute, all about E. coli. We were just talking about E. coli last day. So we do have a few more things to talk about uh, regarding bacteria. And uh, then we're going to get into topic six and we'll see how much we end up covering and that will determine what's going to be on the, uh, on the midterm. So I'll talk about the midterm uh, just for a minute at the end today. So before I get into things though, I do want to talk about uh, the lab reports. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to give you some tips at the beginning of every lecture, uh, maybe about two minutes worth. And uh, just for you to have some things to think about while you're writing your lab three formal report. I know there's lots of time still to write this, but uh, you know, uh, you're probably working on it a little bit over reading week. So anyway, here's some tips. So you're gonna have some titles. Uh, you're gonna have a title for your report and titles for your uh, graphs. And here's some title tips. So first of all, I keep emphasizing this is make sure you do include the species binomial name. So for the beetroot, that's beta vulgaris, that's right in the lab manual. If you don't know the uh, uh, binomial name for something, you can always Google it. Remember that the binomial name will be in italics and uh, the genus will be uh, a capital letter, so capital B in this case. So make sure your title is informative, okay? Uh, so think about the variables that were used in the experiment. So things like temperature, um, things like uh, solvents. Uh, so those are kind of key words that need to be in that title. And uh, so it, it could be a long sentence. Uh, there's different ways to certainly write these kind of titles. And uh, the title for your report is worth two, two marks. And uh, the title for your, um, for your graphs is gonna be worth a few marks each for each of those graphs. So here, here's some examples, right? And these are um, obviously not for our experiment. I modified a little bit, but maybe you get the idea of what I'm seeing here. Uh, two titles, effective cold temperature on humans. Um, that's okay, but that's not gonna get you two marks, right? Um, I wanna see more than that. That might be a good headline if you were a newspaper uh, journalist or something like that. But for a scientific uh, technical writing paper, I want details and specifics. So you can see the, the other one that's written there, it says effect of cold temperatures and exams on the mental health. So there we go. So you can already see they're mentioning both variables, the dependent and independent variable. So in this case, so when one variable is temperatures and exams, the other variable, um, the responding variable is mental health. Um, temperatures on what, right? So beet roots, so beta vulgaris, or in this case, temperatures on young adult humans, which are, there's the binomial name, homo sapiens, and how I've measured it. So that one's actually pretty good, pretty detailed. Uh, you need to come up with one uh, for the lab three. So the beet roots, that's gonna include the words temperature and solvents and what were you trying to do? Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the results section for a minute as well. So I'm hoping at this stage, everyone has at least uh, tried to crunch the data and produce some graphs. And uh, so part of the experiment is to present your results in a results section. And the results section is actually gonna include two parts. It's gonna include a written component, okay? And this is gonna be in paragraphs. So make sure everything you do right for me in your lab reports is in paragraphs. I noticed from the, uh, haven't, haven't started marking the labs uh, from lab one and two, but some people want to seem to give me uh, point form stuff. Uh, I wanna see full sentences, okay? Proper sentences, proper paragraphs. So what does this paragraph look like? Um, this paragraph, well, you could do two paragraphs or three, kind of depends on how wordy you are. Uh, try not to make it really long, but your results section should be relatively concise. So one long paragraph or two or three short ones. And uh, it's gonna basically talk about the graphs. Okay, so talk about the graphs, uh, give me the trend, uh, refer to the graphs. I'll, I'll give an example on that. The other part of the results is gonna be your actual graphs. So like I said, hopefully you've had a chance to work on these graphs. You should have three of them. Uh, one that's corresponding to each table. So we have uh, table one, which is the standard curve. Uh, the second one is the temperature experiment and the third one is a solvent experiment. So this section does not include your tables. Okay, your tables, uh, that's rough data. Uh, these are gonna go in the appendix of your report. And uh, so you're gonna have them there at the back uh, for me to look at. 
Um, normally everyone has different data, but uh, you can include them in your appendix anyway. And you're not discussing your results. You're just talking about the trend. Uh, interpreting the results, that's for the discussion, okay? So the discussion section is where you're gonna give me lots of information. So be brief, informative, specific. Uh, here are our two examples. So you can see uh, two examples there, and it says which is better. So there's the first one and the second one. So take a good look at that. And so it, it's probably obvious that the first one is better. But why is this? Uh, so the second one is not a bad sentence, but it's just not giving me specifics, right? The highest temperature, what is the highest temperature? The lowest temperature, I, I mean, I, you know, what if I can't remember? Or what if I, uh, you know, I'm trying to, you know, you're, you're publishing something or you're, you're reporting something. I don't know what a high temperature is. It could be 100 degrees, it could be 300 degrees, right? So make sure you, you know, you give those specifics. And then it says how much leakage, right? So uh, you can see in the first one, and it's telling you exactly how much leakage. So 16 micromolars at the minus 20, 10.5 micromolars at the 85. And also, even better, this is referring us to the original data. So it's saying, hey, if you wanna see all the data, you can go see figure two. So that's one sentence, and that's what your results is gonna look like. So I would say most of your results, like you're gonna have, uh, like I said, three graphs. And for each graph, you're gonna have maybe about three, four sentences, uh, depending on you know, how your writing style and all that. Uh, basically just saying, hey, here's the graph, here's the trend. Uh, if you wanna see more, go see that graph, go see figure two or whatever. Okay, so hopefully that's some helpful information for you. Uh, if you can't remember all this, go back and review the uh, lecture video. But uh, we are gonna move on and come back to, um, we're talking about bacteria. So we finished off last day talking about E. coli. And like I said, E. coli is great. It does some wonderful stuff for us. Uh, some E. coli, they make us sick. And uh, if you continue on in biology, you'll probably hear about E. coli lots. Uh, it comes up in conversation a lot. It's a great tool for molecular biology labs. We use it all the time. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, it's one of the names of bacteria that some people actually know. And, uh, but there are a couple other things I want to talk about regarding bacteria to kind of finish off the topic is uh, one huge reason, which is probably obvious why we are actually interested in bacteria is that many of them make us sick. Uh, we've talked about anthrax a few times already in this class. I mentioned it uh, when we were talking about, um, who were we talking about? Robert Koch, who was looking at, uh, you know, the scientific method and what was the cause of this disease. And I mentioned that animals were dying of anthrax and you can get anthrax in your lungs and that's actually really, really bad to have. Uh, most humans who get anthrax, they're in contact with animals and they're getting it uh, in their skin and it gives these really ugly looking, uh, you know, skin infections. But um, anthrax is just one of many. Oh, there's inhalation anthrax. And I think I mentioned before that anthrax was uh, um, also the cause of death of some of the bison in Alberta years ago. So that's not the only organism that makes us sick. Uh, there are viruses, yes, uh, but bacteria, maybe somewhere around 80, 85% of all the infectious diseases out there are actually bacterial in nature. Uh, this is just a few of them. You may have heard of some of them, maybe have had some of them, hopefully you haven't had flesh eating disease. Um, but uh, actually there's some pretty nasty ones on there, so I'm hoping you haven't had most of them on that list. Um, but uh, yeah, they're making us sick and this is why we're, we're interested in them. And um, so to treat bacterial infections, one thing that we can do is use antibiotics. And uh, so I do wanna talk about antibiotics for a couple of minutes and then to finish off this topic. Um, one term you may have heard uh, regarding antibiotics is the term superbug. So you can see superbug, it says bacteria that develop resistance to typical treatments, right? or really it means they've, um, they've developed resistance to many types of treatments. So one superbug that's worth mentioning is this one here. Uh, so we've talked about Staphylococcus aureus. I mentioned this before, this is an organism that infects our skin or it can live on our skin and uh, it has a goldish color when we culture it. And uh, there's a strain out there called methicillin resistant, which Often nowadays we're calling multi-drug, multi-drug. 
resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which is actually a better term because most people don't know what methicillin is. It's a type of uh, penicillin. So this organism, uh, so, you know, there's how many people on this Zoom call right now? About 10 or 12 of us. Uh, so probably two or three of us have this on us on our skin right now. Uh, it's really, really common. It doesn't necessarily make you sick until it gets kind of underneath. And uh, so it can give you skin infections, which will look like blisters or impetigo or, or, or something like that. And most of those infections uh, do go away eventually. Sometimes they take a long time. Sometimes they go away quickly. Um, where this particular organism is really dangerous is when it gets involved in invasive procedures. So if you're in a hospital and you get surgery or a catheter and you get this in your blood, it can be actually uh, uh, very, very serious. So uh, this is kind of just a quick review of those structures. And uh, I kind of just wanted to show you, you know, um, kind of review what some of these things are, right? What they're made of. So we talked about plasma membranes and DNA ribosomes, capsules, slime layers, and so on. And the reason why we've been talking about these things is because many of them are clinically relevant structures. So like I mentioned, uh, if you've got uh, pili, or capsules and slime layers, these things are actually allowing organisms to attach to human tissues, which is bad for us and good for them and can help cause disease. Some of these other, um, some of these other uh, um, components of the bacterial cells are actually targets for antibiotics as well. And uh, this is what I wanna talk about right now. I just realized that unfortunately my slides somehow got a little bit out of order, but, uh, like I said, I want to finish off in talking about antibiotics. And some of these, some of these structures are targets for these antibiotics. So what do I mean by targets? So by targets, I mean that the antibiotics are, are drugs that will kill bacteria and hopefully not kill or give side effects to the human. That's the whole idea. And so these particular drugs, they target things that are unique to the bacteria and, uh, and we don't have it in human cells. So the biggest group, you can see there's a whole bunch of classes of these drugs are, for example, targeting cell wall synthesis. So human cells, we do not have cell walls. So this means if we have drugs that will attack a bacterial cell wall, it will damage the bacterial cell and not damage any human cells. So you can see there's a whole bunch here. I wanna talk uh, specifically about penicillins. Um, but this goes for a whole bunch of these other uh, bacterial structures. So back to ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes are unique. They're different in bacteria than in our cells. So some drugs like tetracyclines, um, um, pretty commonly prescribed antibiotic, uh, actually target bacterial ribosomes. There are drugs that target bacterial membranes because they have different phospholipids in some cases. There are drugs that, that target other uh, things like, um, like DNA enzymes. So the one that I want you to know is penicillin, and uh, we're gonna talk about that right now. And so it says here that penicillin, these drugs, they inhibit peptidoglycan biosynthesis. So peptidoglycan, of course, is the cell wall carbohydrate that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. So how does penicillin work? So there's my little cell. You can see I've given him a wall. And, uh, if you think about it, like if I were doing construction in my house and uh, I wanted to do something to my wall, um, I actually have to probably break it, right? And that's kind of what happens in a bacteria. So you can imagine this hypothetical wall in my house and I want to build a new bathroom or something. And so you may have to take down some drywall, uh, maybe uh, put in some new studs and so on, and then you put up new drywall. And that's kind of what happens in a bacteria. It, 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 as it grows, um, the wall is, is it's a rigid carbohydrate. And so it actually has to cut some holes. And so you can see there's some holes in there, cut and then puts in the new material. So there's my new carbohydrates, my new peptidoglycan um, monomers, and you get new cells. So penicillin is kind of like, as that thing is growing, it's kind of like throwing a wrench in there in the machinery. And uh, those enzymes are inhibited. And then my bacterial cells kind of just, they burst open. So that's how penicillin works. It's inhibiting enzymes. And we're gonna talk about enzymes after the midterm, and we'll probably come back and talk about penicillin a little bit. Um, I'm calling them penicillins because there's actually a whole bunch of these drugs. So I think there's at least three or 400 now a days, and uh, they're, 
There are um, some a lot of chemists will call them this thing as well, beta lactams. And you can see the thing they have all in common. Uh, they have that little ring with the nitrogen and the double bonded uh, oxygen sticking off the side. And, and there's a whole bunch of different ones out there. So this uh, one here, penicillin G, this is the first penicillin that was ever discovered. Uh, we don't use it anymore usually because it's, uh, you have to inject it. And so one of the more common ones that's prescribed nowadays is penicillin B. You can see it's acid resistant, which means it can survive the stomach uh, or ampicillin as well. Okay, so that's basically it for uh, bacteria and prokaryotes. I wanted to show you one more picture and you're probably wondering what this is, or maybe you're not. Maybe you're looking at this and thinking it's so obvious. That's clearly E. coli, um, it's sort of. Uh, this is actually not real E. coli. This is actually someone I know who dressed up as E. coli for Halloween. So this is actually my sister-in-law. Uh, her and her husband, they went to the dollar store and bought a whole bunch of glow sticks, and uh, she's a microbiologist, and so naturally she wanted to make a E. coli, and you can see the little plasmids and the ribosomes and whatnot in her, uh, in her E. coli and all the little pillar on the outside. So I thought you might enjoy that picture. If you're looking for any ideas for uh, next October, there's a Halloween costume idea. All right, so that took a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. We'll cover what we cover, and uh, it just means maybe a little less material on the midterm for you guys. And I'm sure everyone will be totally happy with that. Switching gears now to topic six, we're going to talk about eukaryotic cells. So these are the ones with the nuclei, right? Um, hopefully remember that. Remember you means true and karyote means nucleus. So we want to talk about what's going on in these guys here. And uh, of course we like them because uh, that's what we are. We are eukaryotes. There's a, another picture from the textbook. So eukaryote, true nucleus, prokaryote, no nucleus. So just a reminder, we made this table here uh, in class. Uh, I typed it up in Word and uh, it just talked about some of the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And you can see, if I'm just going through this list here, we talked about uh, cell walls. Um, we talked about prokaryotic uh, DNA. I mentioned their circular chromosomes and they're found in the nucleoid region. We talked about uh, ribosomes. We talked about uh, prokaryotic uh, division, which is called binary fission. And we talked about their flagella. So we still have a few things over here on the right to talk about in terms of what is going on in eukaryotes. Um, I don't actually think I have it in my lecture notes because we're gonna talk about it uh, later on. But in terms of the DNA, the DNA in eukaryotes is usually found in linear strands. And you probably know that we have a lot more chromosomes. We don't just have one. In fact, humans have 40, uh, what is it, 46, right? So 23 pairs, 23 you got from mom and 23 you got from dad. And so now you have 46 chromosomes. So our genomes are not only just uh, more numerous in terms of having more chromosomes, but they're much, much more complex. Uh, in terms of size, uh, they're just massive. And um, so they're kept, uh, we got to keep things organized. So we keep things in a nucleus. With that much DNA, you probably could not do without a nucleus, a nuclear membrane. The DNA is packaged in these things here called histones, and we're going to talk about histone proteins. I think that's topic, uh, maybe topic 12. So we'll come back to that in a bit. And uh, mitosis and meiosis, that's topic 12 as well, so a bit more on that. Um, but you may notice this here, that uh, in terms of reproduction, uh, prokaryotes, they don't do sexual reproduction. Uh, they might exchange DNA through conjugation, but that has nothing to do with reproduction. Uh, eukaryotes, depending on the organism, we, we, there's asexual and, and sexual uh, reproductive uh, mechanisms, and uh, it gets really complicated when you get to plants, and uh, well, we're not going to talk about plant reproduction in this class, um, but um, if you're interested in plants, take Biology 108. I know David likes to talk about plants a lot. Now we're going to talk about these flagella as well, and they're going to be a bit more after the midterm as well. So I guess after the reading week. So this is kind of your typical um, image you see in these textbooks, right? You have a prokaryote cell in, a, in an animal cell or a plant cell. Um, and we're, we're kind of getting get into this and talk about some of the differences between animals and plants and things like that. But uh, these typical pictures, um, never quite show things how they really are, um, unfortunately. But they're a good start 
of understanding the, the parts of the cells and what's going on and, and differences between these things. So we'll, we'll come back to this, um, the differences between animals and plants. And we'll talk about fungi a little bit too and a couple other things. So first of all, let's talk about the cytoplasm, okay? Uh, so we mentioned it last day as, uh, or last week as part of bacterial cells. And you can see in this case, I actually have a definition on the slide. And you can think of it as the, uh, the liquid or the insides of the cell. And uh, this is where we have all sorts of things being contained. We've got solutes, we've got enzymes, we've got RNA, we've got ribosomes are all contained in the cytoplasm. By the way, you might see the term cytosol, and it's pretty much used interchangeably with the cytoplasm. The cytosol, I think, really just refers to the liquid. The cytoplasm includes the liquid and the other stuff, but does it really matter? Not really. Uh, the, the words are used interchangeably by most people anyway. So I want to show you this uh, because this is a micrograph and you don't see much in there. It just looks like it's water. Um, but the reality is that the cytoplasm is loaded with stuff. And uh, this diagram here, I like better. This is a fluorescent so a micrograph showing the cytoskeleton. So we're going to talk about the cytoskeleton in topic seven. Um, so more on that later. The cytoskeleton is basically a bunch of protein fibers that are in there giving a structure and doing all sorts of other cool things. All right, so um, let's talk about the endomembrane system. And uh, I am going to make some notes in a minute or two on, I'll do it on, again on a Word document. Uh, so if you wanna have a piece of paper handy, I will come back to that. So endomembrane, just look at the word. Endo means inside, membrane means membrane. And system means these things are probably connected somehow. And so what this diagram here, I really like it is showing is the connectivity of all of these uh, particular organelles. You can see we've got the nuclear membrane over here that's connected to the ER. We've got these little things that uh, shuttle between the ER and the Golgi called uh, vesicles or vesicles. We've got the Golgi. We've got, uh, here's, here's a vesicle right here. We've got the plasma membrane. Uh, the endomembrane system also includes vacuoles and peroxisomes as well, and lysosomes, which are down here at the bottom. So all these things are connected, uh, either physically directly connected or they're connected in that vesicles can, uh, can shuttle in between these things. Uh, so they're called the endomembrane system. Um, the exceptions to organelles are the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. These things are not connected and they're kind of independent organelles. And we'll talk about them, probably won't get to it today, um, which means it'll be after reading week. But that's fine. After reading week, we're going to talk about uh, photosynthesis and mitochondria, uh, or photosynthesis and chloroplasts, respiration and mitochondria anyway. So we'll get there. Uh, there's another picture. I like this one here because uh, it's uh, a little bit more accurate in terms of the size of things. You can see the Golgi is actually a pretty small organelle. And it shows a bunch of other things that you might see in plant cells. So these, this giant vacuole here. So this is the giant vacuole and, and so on. So it's a little bit different. Um, and uh, sometimes I like that because it's, it's a bit more accurate in terms of what we're actually seeing in uh, a eukaryotic cell. I also like that it shows that the, uh, the cytoplasm is loaded with these membrane systems. So first place to start is the nucleus. Okay, so you probably know that the nucleus is where the DNA is found, and you know it's a pretty large organelle. And uh, you may not know it's connected to the ER, and this diagram shows that. I'm looking right here. You can see that the ER and the nuclear membrane are actually connected. So sometimes when people in the journals talk about the ER, they're actually talking about the outer surface of the nucleus as well. So what is in the nucleus? Of course, we've got our DNA, and our DNA is there in the form of chromatin or chromosomes. Um, those words are used interchangeably as well, and we'll come back to them in topic, uh, I think it's topic 12. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, you know, these definitions of what a chromosome for, is versus chromatin a bit more. Uh, you can see uh, what it's showing in this diagram. These little purple bead things, those are actually histone proteins. And again, like I said, I'll talk about them in uh, the future. But what to know for now is that when I say chromosome or chromatin, I basically mean the DNA and some of the proteins that are associated with it. So that's kind of the difference. When I say chromatin, 
it's DNA and associated proteins. When I say DNA, I just mean nucleic acids. So much more on DNA in the second half of the course. Okay, so we will come back to DNA. So one thing that uh, is visible in um, the nucleus is often a, a darkly stained spot. And uh, you can see it's uh, shown here in this diagram right about here and shown on that micrograph on the left, and that is the nucleolus. So notice there is an extra couple of letters in that word. Uh, and so what is the nucleolus? The nucleolus is basically where ribosomes are put together. So what you're seeing in that stain is that uh, there's actually a load of RNA there, and the RNA stains really well. And uh, so it shows up as a kind of a, a dot. Uh, sometimes you see two of them on animal cells. Uh, some plant cells actually have dozens of them. Uh, some plant cells are really massive, by the way. I don't know why they need dozens of nucleoluses, nucleoluses eyes. I'm not sure what the plural of that is. Um, I'm guessing nucleoluses. Uh, and, uh, and that's where they're put together. Okay, so um, that's what a nucleolus is. It's a bunch of ribosomal RNA, and then the proteins are kind of coming in there and assembling those, those ribosomal subunits. So uh, how do you get in and out of the nucleus? question not necessarily people aren't always asking. Uh, we have these things called nuclear pores. So here's a nuclear pore right over here. And a nuclear pore um, actually spans uh, both layers of the nuclear membrane. So you may, may, may not realize that the nuclear membrane is actually two layers. And if you look at this uh, the zoom in here, you can see it's, they sort of fold in on themselves. You can see this layer folds in and it's actually a double membrane system. Not sure why that's necessary. You can see these things on the outside of ribosomes, so that's actually some rough endoplasmic reticulum as well. So these, uh, these uh, nuclear pores um, are like holes, and uh, you, can, you can see them here. I'm looking over here on the left, uh, the, the subunits there. I can't remember exactly how many subunits. It's like seven or nine subunits. They're pretty large protein complexes, and uh, these are allowing things to go in and out. They're not just holes. They're not just pores that things can go in willy-nilly. Uh, there's actually rules of engagement, and they, they very carefully control what goes in and what goes out. So let's just think for a minute about what goes in a nuclear pore and what is going on. So what is going in the nucleus? I, I believe it or not, I just told you a minute ago, right? Remember the nucleolus, we're making um, ribosomes. So we've got to bring in ribosomal proteins. Ribosomal proteins. So what else is going in? We're also bringing in other proteins. So any uh, enzyme that uh, is doing something with DNA needs to go in there. So we'll call them, uh, let's say, DNA replication enzymes. We're also talking about transcription enzymes. So we'll talk about transcription later. So you're probably seeing a theme there. Proteins have to go in, right? The proteins are made somewhere outside in the cytoplasm. They're made in ribosomes. So they have to get in and they go through nuclear pore. Uh, the last thing that needs to go in, of course, you probably know that there's DNA in the nucleus. So we also need to bring in nucleotide subunits. Nucleotides, I'll just call them. You can call them subunits if you want. So if you want to might make more DNA, you need to bring in pieces. So what goes out then? Uh, not the DNA. DNA stays in there, stays in the nucleus. But what else are we making? We were just talking about making ribosomes. So we can say that ribosome subunits. The ribosomes aren't completely assembled when they leave. Uh, and what else goes out? Not the DNA. What else is in the nucleus? RNA. So what kind of RNA are we talking about? So messenger RNA and transfer RNA. So hopefully you, you've seen those before. If you haven't, no big deal. We're going to talk about them in the second half of the course. So, you know, that's what the first half of the course, I guess, is. It's the prequel and the second half is the sequel where we kind of pick up and talk about some of these other things. Okay, so hopefully you got that. I'll come back to this slide in a moment. Uh, what I'm going to do now, though, is take a few notes. Um, and uh, I just got to pull up my Word document. There it is. And I got to remember all the things we talked about. I should have uh, made some uh, notes earlier. So first thing, 
we have talked about was the cytoplasm. Okay, so we said that cytoplasm is a fluid or gel contained within the cell has many enzymes, solutes, etc. So that's not too bad. I could probably do a little bit better on that. Just have to think about it a bit more. Um, okay, so we talked about the cytoplasm. We talked about the nucleus. I'm just making a list here of everything. And then I'll come back to the definitions. So we talked about chromatin, um, nuclear pore complexes, the nucleolus, and one more that is coming up we're going to talk about it is the nuclear lamina. Okay, let's make a definition for each of those. So the nucleus uh, is a membrane down organelle that contains chromosomes. I guess I use the word chromosomes one place and chromatin in another place. So I'll just do it like that. So chromatin is DNA plus associated proteins. Okay, so I think we've defined most of these things already. I'm just writing this down so that you can get it. Uh, nuclear pore complexes. Maybe what I need to do is give a little bit more space in all these things here. I'll do that for you. I like things to be neat and tidy. Hopefully your mom tells you that too. There we go. Okay. Uh, DNA pore complexes. These are, um, these allow substances to go in or out of the nucleus. Nucleolus, this is the site of ribosomal subunit assembly. There we go. Okay, and the last one, I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment to, to uh, that I'll show you some pictures first. There's our nuclear pore complexes. The last one to mention is something called the nuclear lamina. So there's that word, nuclear lamina. And, oops. The nuclear lamina is uh, uh, part of the cytoskeleton. So we've got these protein fibers and what they are doing is basically holding the nucleus together. Uh, the nucleus is a very, very large membrane and membranes don't like to be that big with a little bit of support. So you can think of it as kind of scaffolding on the inside of the nucleus. And, uh, and it's a relatively permanent scaffolding. It's just holding it into a big, large spherical structure. Um, there's one exception, I said it's mostly permanent. Uh, the exception is that when there is no nucleus. So think for a second, when is there no nucleus? Some people got it right away, can sense it. Some people are thinking, there's no nucleus during mitosis and meiosis. That's when the nuclear membrane disappears and uh, all the chromosomes are getting separated and all that, right? So that's the one exception of when the nuclear lamina is, is broken off. So um, there's the nucleus. There's a the nucleolus. Nucleus, nucleolus, nucleus, nucleolus. Okay, so hopefully you don't get those two confused. All right, let's go quickly back and uh, write a definition for nuclear lamina. These are protein fibers that support the nuclear membrane. So maybe I will put in brackets found on the inside of the nucleus. And they support the nuclear membrane. You could also put a note if you want, this is part of the cytoskeleton. But don't worry about that word cytoskeleton till topic seven, which is after the midterm. Okay. All right, so out of the nucleus, a lot of stuff in the nucleus, and that's actually not everything. That's just only what we cover in biology 107. So take a look at all these other things that are grayed out. We want to start talking about uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, what is going on there. So back to the endomembrane system. You can see, uh, like I said, uh, I like this diagram because it shows how everything is connected. 
And when we talk about the endomembrane system, we're obviously talking about the membranous organelles. So the uh, nucleolus, for example, is not part of the endomembrane system. It's part of the nucleus, but the nuclear membrane is technically part of the endomembrane system because it actually includes actual membrane. So let's talk about that ER. It's just outside the, uh, the nucleus and uh, it's quite extensive. And uh, you probably know that the ER is loaded full of these ribosomes. I guess I meant to put ribosomes earlier. Uh, I can't remember if I showed you this exact diagram before um, of the uh, ribosomes. I think it's a pretty cool uh, little animation. And you can see uh, with the color code that we've got RNA, which is kind of found in this pasty orange color, and then the proteins in this pasty uh, purplish bluish color. And uh, if you actually take a look, ribosomes um, are more than half of them is made out of RNA. Uh, so I want you to take a look at the top subunit and notice it's flipping around and you're gonna see a little green patch right about now, it's gone. One more look, flipping around, here comes the green patch right now. So hopefully you saw that little green patch. That little green patch is actually where the active site is. So ribosomes are kind of like massive, very complex enzymes and they have active sites and they're making peptide bonds. So we did talk about before how prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes are different beasts. And there's the diagram that I showed you before talking about uh, 70S and 80S ribosomes. And uh, you can see on this that, that uh, um, you've got a large subunit and a small subunit, a large subunit and a small subunit. And so it's those subunits that are assembled in the, in the nucleolus, they don't actually come together until they find a piece of, of uh, messenger RNA, by the way. So there is a very fancy diagram showing the process of transcription, uh, which, which is um, uh, protein production. So this is, uh, if you take a look at this, is, this is a very um, fancy looking picture. So right here, this is the nucleolus. There's the, uh, the DNA there. You can see we've got some nuclear pores with some uh, messenger RNA coming out. So here's my messenger RNA, and it's found a ribosome, which is this blobby thing here. And these little circles are representing my amino acids. My amino acids are folding up into this big protein at the end. So kind of a cool look, looking little picture. So um, you may know, or you may not know, but ribosomes come in kind of two types. Uh, sometimes they're called free and bound ribosomes. So what does that mean? It means some of the ribosomes are loose. They're found in the cytoplasm and they're just floating around. Other ribosomes are actually attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we're going to talk about the endoplasmic reticulum now. And you can see this is actually an electron micrograph showing the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, so why is it called rough? Because it looks rough. When all those spotty ribosomes all over, it just looks like it has a lot of texture to it. And that's where that name came from. So here's the cartoon from the textbook of the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, you can see we, we have uh, two types, right? We've got the rough stuff over here. And we've got this uh, tubular stuff, which we call the smooth ER. So I wanna talk a little bit about both of those. So notice this thing here, it says this is about half of the entire cell volume. This is a very extensive network of membranes. Uh, very, very busy area because there's a lot of synthesis going on in both the smooth and the rough ER. So here's another uh, cartoon, uh, sort of um, hybrid mix with an electron micrograph. You can see, uh, I think this is really clever. This is done by an artist and what they've done is, is this, this part here, is an electron micrograph and then they blended in uh, the other half is the cartoon so they're showing you what they what they think is going on there in terms of the structure of the whole so i thought it was kind of a cool little uh, diagram there notice there's a mitochondria hidden in there i didn't realize that look at that it's uh very small compared to the uh the network of the uh, er so let's talk about the rough er so the big thing about the rough er is that this it has a massive amount of ribosomes. Uh, in some cells, we're talking about 80, 90% of the ribosomes are found in the rough ER. And uh, so what does that mean? What, what happens with the ribosome? Ribosomes make proteins. So this is really just the site, a massive, massive protein manufacturing site. 
Um, the ribosomes are shipped off. They're shipped off in vesicles, so that's technically a function. It's shipping things off in vesicles, which are the proteins. And uh, the proteins, uh, sometimes they get carbohydrates, and that, of course, is called glycosylation. I think I have another picture here of the rough ER. Maybe I don't. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, uh, actually, maybe we'll talk about smooth ER, and then I'll make some more notes uh, on, my, on my sheet there. So that's kind of the bottom line to know is that we've got uh, maybe around 80, 85% of protein synthesis. And these are all, uh, we'll call them, these are all endomembrane proteins, all endomembrane proteins. So what do I mean by endomembrane proteins? I mean that these are all proteins that are going or staying somewhere in the endomembrane system. So think about all these organelles that we were talking about and we're gonna talk about, we've got lysosomes, we've got the ER, we've got the Golgi, we've got the nucleus, uh, we've got the plasma membrane. So any protein that is going to any of those organelles is gonna go through the ER first, the rough ER. So pretty much the cytoplasm proteins are made in the cytoplasm and everything else is made in the ER. Uh, with the exception of the mitochondrial and, and chloroplast proteins. They kind of do their own thing. So what about the smooth ER? So why is the smooth ER smooth? <laughs> this little cartoon I thought was kind of cute. And you can see the smooth ER. He's, uh, um, he's smooth. He's, he's able to uh, pick up some dates, whereas the rough guy is, is disappointed that the other guy is getting all the girls. But um, anyway, cute little cartoon. For so what is the smooth ER? I mentioned there's lots of synthesis going on there. And this is the big one to know, is that the smooth ER is that there's synthesis of lipids. So what lipids are we talking about? Well, all those ones that we talked about before, right? So what did we talk about before? We talked about triacylglycerides. Remember what those are? Triacylglycerides are, uh, we've got three fatty acid molecules. There's my fatty acid molecules. And we've got glycerol here over there, uh, attached them together. We have phospholipids phospholipids. So remember phospholipids are kind of like a triacylglycerol except for you've got a phosphate group uh, making it uh, one end of it polar. And then we've got our steroids. So those are kind of the main lipids that are made there. So a steroid was four, four rings. What did that look like? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then Five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's a terrible diagram, but hopefully you get the idea. Steroids like cholesterol and uh, estrogen, testosterone, and those kind of things. Um, there is number two and three on here. Detoxifying drugs, storing calcium, okay. Uh, it, the, the smooth ER can be very specialized in certain tissues. So storing calcium, this is what happens in your muscle tissues is that the smooth ER stores calcium and uh, the calcium is important in the muscle contraction process. And, uh, but that's not true for all cells. And detoxifying drugs, that's true in your liver in that there's a lot of chemical reactions that go on in the smooth ER that are important for functions in the liver. Uh, I won't ask you about those, but I will ask you about the synthesis of lipids. So you should know that one for sure. All right, let's go to our notes. We'll make a few notes here on these things. So ribosomes, somehow we almost forgot about them. Ribosomes. Okay, and this is, uh, these are for protein synthesis and that process is called translation. Okay, we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. By the way, look at the name endoplasmic reticulum, okay? Uh, endo means in, plasmic basically means cytoplasm. So we've got, and reticulum means network. So what it's saying is you've got a, a, a network of something in the cytoplasm, right? And it's a network of membranes, okay? And, and so it's, it's all in the word. Uh, sometimes you just got to pick it apart. So this is the, this is where we have site of many ribosomes that synthesize, I can't spell today, synthesize. Okay, that seems to be every day I can't spell, but I usually get it in the end. 
site of many ribosomes that synthesize proteins that are destined for endomembrane system organelles. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So it's got lots of ribosomes and the ribosomes synthesize proteins and those proteins are going to all sorts of organelles involved in the endomembrane system. So I'm hoping that makes sense. If not, do contact me. We also have the smooth ER. I'm just gonna write ER, it's a little quicker. And uh, so this is where we have synthesis of lipids. All right, so we have TAGs, phospholipids, phospholipids. And what was the third one? Uh, steroids. Okay, so we're getting there, five, about five minutes left. And I think actually we're, we're about where I want it to be. A um, couple more organelles to talk about. and. Uh, and leave the rest for um, uh, after the midterm, I guess. Uh, so next organelle I'll talk about is the Golgi apparatus. So there it is, uh, and there's Golgi. So that's where the name come from, came from a guy. Uh, you may know it as the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. Um, I think I've seen another name that had the word Golgi in it, Golgi organelle or something like that. Um, so what is the Golgi? It is uh, kind of this funny little thing. It looks like a, almost a stack of uh, blobby like pancakes. Um, and uh, this is kind of like the shipping and receiving center of the cell. So what do I mean by that? It means that we're, we're making stuff in the ER, uh, mostly proteins, and those proteins have to go somewhere. And the first thing they do is they get made in the ER and then they're, they're sent to the Golgi. And the Golgi will process them and send them to other places. So you can kind of think of it as, you know, you, you bring your parcel to the post office and at the post office, they sort things out and send things to where they're supposed to go. So um, what, what are the, the roles here? So this is kind of the main one, protein sorting, right? Secretion is really, it just means the same thing. So I'll, I'll show you what that means. It means we, um, we make things in the ER. And uh, if you take a look, this little green thing is a protein. And that little green protein uh, gets put in a vesicle. There should be, they should show you a vesicle right here somewhere in the middle with that little protein in it. I'll just draw it in. And, uh, and then it goes to the Golgi. So the Golgi has two sides. It has a cis side and a trans side. So it's the same words that are used, cis and trans, as used in chemistry. Cis means close. Trans means opposite. So, um, I, I like to think of cis as like, uh, it's kind of like sisters. So you would imagine sisters would be close to one another, right? Um, trans, like transatlantic flight, you know, you're going far away, right? Something like that. Uh, so it, it goes through the Golgi and uh, as it goes through the Golgi, it, it might get some carbohydrates on it. So it might get glycosylated and then eventually it's gonna go somewhere. So in this case here, secretion means it's going to the plasma membrane. You can see it's getting, uh, um, spit out of the cell at the bottom there. That's what secretion means. It, mean, it means just emitting something uh, externally to the cell. So here's from the textbook showing the same thing. You can see it's going from the ER to the Golgi, the cis Golgi, then the trans Golgi, and then gets uh, uh, sent out, uh, out of the exit. Uh, sorting, sorting is just the same thing, except for now it could go to other places. We could go to the ER, back to the ER, nuclear membrane, could go to lysosomes, could go to vacuoles, and so on. So lots of potential uh, of places to go from the Golgi. I don't know exactly why this can't be done directly from the ER, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, having one specialized task is not a bad thing, rather than multitasking. Uh, what was that last thing? That last thing was protein processing. So kind of the main thing here is this thing here we talked about already, glycosylation. Glycosylation. So remember glycosylation, glyco means carbohydrate. And so this is the act of putting a carbohydrate onto something. So here is an example of a protein that's been glycosylated. You can see it has a bunch of each of these little uh, hexagons are representing a different uh, monosaccharide. And uh, this particular, monos this particular uh, carbohydrate that's put on there is a pretty typical um, glycosylation event that happens uh, on a lot of proteins that go through the ER. It says here, if you read the text, it says most 
uh, proteins going through the ER are acquiring these 14 sugars, and that's part of the process. So glycosylation, by the way, starts in the ER. Uh, so some of the carbohydrates are added there, some of the carbohydrates are added in the Golgi. So if I asked you on a midterm, where are proteins glycosylated, you could say both, and they would both answers would be correct, the rough ER and Golgi apparatus. Okay, so I'll finish off on this slide here. And um, what I will do, um, by the way, hopefully you can see some of our organelles there, right? So this big thing, nucleus, nuclear pores, it's kind of cartoony, but this thing here is the Golgi. And we've got all these little vesicles in between. So I better actually, I, I know you want to go, but I want to um, go and just finish up this note here. So two things to add, vesicles, so these goals are small membranous compartments that transport materials between organelles. Of course, I can't fix compartments there. Compartments. There we go. Missed a couple letters. Then we have the Golgi. Um, okay, glycosylates proteins. Maybe I'll start off with receives proteins from the rough ER, glycosylates them, and sends them to other parts of the cell. Okay, sorry I forgot to put that in there. So we'll figure out all these definitions. Uh, on Wednesday, it's going to be all review. Um, I might just spend a couple minutes at the beginning uh, making a list here of uh, what we did cover in topic six and uh, what, what will be left over for after the midterm. But other than that, all of Wednesday will be review. Uh, hopefully you've had time to look at the material for the course. Uh, like I said, we've probably covered a lot more than you've realized. And uh, you're probably ready now to try uh, some of those sample questions that I have on there, the 70 sample questions. I would, I would I strongly advise you to go through that and, uh, and take a careful look at the ones that you don't get right, um, because that is gonna uh, help you study, it's gonna help you, understanding, uh, help you understand what, what you're missing in, in all of your studying. Anyway, sorry for taking you over time again. Uh, I seem to like to do that lately, but uh, that's it for today. So I will see you on Wednesday.